God be blessed and all of his people. And everybody said, Amen. God bless all of you. So happy to see you. I always praise God for you because what? You are irreplaceable. You can always go get you another teacher, but you can't always go and get another audience. And I want you to know you're always special to me. Always glad for you to be here, learn and study of God's word because God's word is the only way you can learn how to grow in leaps and bound spiritually. And in this lesson, we're going to be seeing you need to have a relationship with God. Amen. And before we get started, I want to make sure I thank everybody, especially you, for your diligence always being here week after week after week and for Pastor Turner and for all of those videos, those that do the posting, the typing, thank all of you, whatever your role is. And thank all of you that are praying for the combined classes. Amen? Amen. Now, here in our lesson today, we're going to be studying about Jesus' first miracle. And when it comes to miracles, a couple things you got to be remember. God never promised us miracles. Amen? Please understand that. That's his choice. If he wants to do a miracle, yes, he does. But in this lesson, we're going to find out Jesus had what? Specific purpose in mind when he did miracles. Miracles were to grow your faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And he did a combined 35 miracles are recorded in the New Testament. And in the book of John... We're going to be looking at one specifically today, but guess what? There are eight miracles in the book of John, and quite often time they cover uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, but they don't necessarily cover the eighth one because it's the second great catch of fish, and he had a great catch of fish, then he had a second one, and sometimes they over omit that one as well as the first one. And sometimes they over omit that one too because it was not a public miracle. And we're going to talk about that in the lesson. A public miracles were tons, multitudes of people saw. And then uh, private miracles like this particular wedding there was only a few people that know, knew about the transforming or transformation or change of what? Water to wine. So that's why they sometimes often omit it. But nevertheless, we're going to look at a little bit more depth here shortly. Let's have a word of prayer and what? Start on our lesson. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. You are good in your mercy and do it forever. Praise you, Lord that you are a miracle worker, that we serve a God that can and does miracles. And Lord, it's your option to do miracles on our behalf. And when you do, Lord, you're always trying to get us to have faith in you when they, we see how extraordinary your splendor and your, your, your power and magnificence. When we see that, Lord, it should encourage our faith and cause us to come to you. Help us to look at this lesson in this light. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now here we are with Jesus' first miracle. Amen. Now, we said on the very, very outset, if sometimes they don't look at this as his first miracle, even though it is, because of what? It was private more so than what? Public. And we'll see how private it was here as we get into the lesson. All right. Now, John chapter 1. John recorded what? Eight miracles, even though sometimes they only count what? 
seven of them, and here we are now. And we know that he did the miracles in order to what? Display his power and authority and what? Get people to what? Embrace him as the what? Son of God. Now, chapter 2, verse 1. Look how it starts off. That, that starts off with and. That's a conjunction that ties it to what was said in the previous chapter. And the previous chapter, uh, uh, verses 43 through 51, he what? Had just what? Just called two additional disciples. And they were none other than Philip and, and Nathaniel. Now, at this particular time, he only had called five disciples, so not even all the disciples were present, okay? So now keep that in mind. So that's one of the other reasons why they don't uh, look at it oftentimes as a public uh, miracle, but more so a private. Now, after these three days, here he is in Cana. Now, Cana was what? Four and a half miles from his hometown, of Nazareth. Here he is now uh, in Galilee, Cana of Nazareth, and, of, of Nazareth at, uh, four and a half miles from Nazareth in Cana of Galilee. Excuse me. Amen. And it goes on and tells us, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, if we take a close look at that, we can see that more than likely, uh, with Jesus being there, along with his mother, there's a possibility that what? Jesus was invited because of his mother. Amen. And that also brings in the fact that just maybe, maybe his mother was a friend and or maybe even a relative or a close friend of the family. Okay. And it lets us know that, but... Nevertheless, this verse does bring some credibility to the fact that Jesus may have been there because of his mother. But look at verse 2. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, this is a marriage celebration, a very, very private marriage. And we're going to find out as Jesus did the what? transforming the transformation that takes place here. Water to wine. He's introducing something, and we're going to see exactly what it was. Now, it goes on in verse 3. In verse 3, and when they wanted what? Wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, here we find Jesus' mother again. Now, we're not sure if, if uh, not only the possibility of being a relative and or a close friend of the family, why his mother's here, she's very, very intimate in what's going on, and they have did the unthinkable. What was it like to run out of wine back in Jesus' day? <laughs> My goodness, that was a major catastrophe. That was, that was what you call, you call that a social disaster to run out of wine. And, and it was the same thing about food. And it was an insult to your guests for you to run out of wine, let alone run out of food as well. Amen? Amen. This was an emergency. And who did she go to get? Jesus. That's why it's always good to have a relationship with Jesus. Because what? You never know as you travel down life journey road when you're going to have an emergency a disaster, and you're going to need somebody to get you out of your situation. And your situations can be what? Far and wide. It could be a sick room, a sick bed. Hello, 
Baby need a new pair of shoes. Baby needs some milk. No matter what it is, Jesus always can help you in your situation. Amen? Amen. Now, this was a, a biological relationship here that we're talking about, but we're talking about a spiritual relationship. You need Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, it goes on to say, and his mother saith unto him, they have no wine. Now, wine in the scripture is said to be uh, a sign of joy and God's blessing. And it doesn't say anything negative about wine at all. If you look in, if you look in Proverbs 3 and 10, jot that down, as well as in, uh, excuse me, Proverbs 3 and 10, and also what? Psalms 104, verse 15, and it explains uh, the joy and the blessing that wine is about. Now, you cannot find it in the Bible that um, wine uh, being supportive of being drunkard. No. Now, the wine, the Bible does not support drunkenness. Amen. But it does say positive things in regard to wine. Now, one thing, I got a little trivia for you. Which was safer to drink in Jesus' days? Water or wine mixed with water? <laughs> That's exactly right. It was safer to drink water mixed with wine than it was to drink water. You got to remember, they didn't have purified water in Jesus' lay day that we have today. Please understand that. What did the Apostle Paul tell Timothy? He says, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. Amen. Now, there was a lot of bacteria and stuff in their water, and uh, that they didn't have the advantages that we have today with processed water. And so uh, wine was accepted uh, for its medicinal effects. Amen. Now, now, please understand, wine was never meant to be for us to what? Concoction drunkenness. Now, some folks get caught up in wine, and they use this particular scripture. They say, well, this, this, Jesus, Jesus okayed the wine. Matter of fact, he even made some wine from it. So it's okay to drink wine. And, and I'm not going to say anything different than that, but I will tell you one thing. Jesus accepted wine here. He made wine here. And it's not so much wine itself, it's your motive for drinking the wine. Now, in the 20th century society that we live in, most people indulge in wine for a specific purpose. <laughs> they drink wine because they want to get intoxicated. That's what they, now, this was not what their intent was here, even though it possibly did happen. But before you start to trying to support the scriptures to support what you think it ought to be about, please consider the situation. This was a celebrated event here, and Jesus was there, and he what? Come through in an emergency and made the wine. But it's also symbolic. Who knows what the symbolism behind this is? Amen? Amen? All right, good. Symbolism is Jesus was announcing that a change was coming. That's what he was announcing, a change. A change, it was going to go from what? Judaism to Christianity. Amen? Jesus was ushering out the old sacrificial system and ushering in the new sacrificial uh, system. And it tells you, tells you, Hebrews 8 and 7 says, if the first covenant 
would have been faultless, there would be no need for a second one. And that's first covenant, second covenant that he's talking about. The first covenant, what happened? The priests, they sacrificed animals when? Daily. Daily. And once a year, they would go into holies if holy and sacrifice uh, animals for, for uh, forgiveness of the people's sin for a whole year to the next year. But Jesus was announcing there's going to be a change. The Lamb of God. And that's who I am. And what? I'm going to sacrifice my own self. And it's going to be done once and for all. And it forgives sin from what? Past, present, and for the remaining future. Because I am God. And I'm shedding the blood of God. And that's what this water to wine represents, symbolic, that Jesus was ushering in a change. And that's why you see the change from water to wine. And there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible, a whole bunch of them. Jesus said, uh, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. They misinterpreted that. They thought he was talking about tearing down the physical temple. But he wasn't talking about it. He was talking about his body and his burial. Kill me and I'll raise in 30 days. Excuse me, three days. Amen. Did they interpret that right? No. The only thing I want to do is keep you on track here. Jesus was ushering in something new. This was the beginning of his miracle. And he's saying, hey, I am the Messiah. I am going to bring about something new. The old sacrificial system be done away with. I am the Lamb of God. I'm going to sacrifice once and what? For all. Don't forget the symbolism behind this. God saved the best for last which was Jesus Christ. Okay, I wanted, to, I wanted to bring that out now so we can look at that as the lesson develops. Now, here he is here now, so they have no wine. Without no wine, without Jesus Christ, what? That's a major catastrophe. Amen. We need a Savior. And guess who that Savior is? Jesus Christ himself. Amen. That's the comparison. Now, uh, why was it that they ran out of wine? How long did a wedding last back in Jesus' day? Hello. Wedding last for what? A whole week. So it's easy to see how they could have, what? Ran out of wine. And of course they did. And Jesus was right there to do what? Rescue them. Now, here he is, here. And Jesus said unto her, and Jesus said unto her, and look what he says. Look what he says here. Woman, woman, talking to his mother, what have I to do with thee? He says, why, why are you dragging me into this? <laughs> it's not my time yet. Jesus was on a schedule. He was on God's timetable. And she wanted him to rescue these people in their social disaster. And I don't know if you know it or not, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you got a social disaster going on in your life. Hello. You need Jesus. Amen. And you got a disaster going on whether you realize it or not. Amen. The relationship has to be there. And it shows what? Her mother, his mother had what? Absolute trust in him. Amen. Now, when he said woman, that was not disrespectful in Jesus' day. That was very, very 
polite, very warm, and very, very loving. Amen. It sounds a little brutal and harsh to us, but that in their time, it didn't mean that. And it's saying, that really is the equivalent of dear woman. Amen. And that's what it would definitely mean. Now, save them from their embarrassment, their disgrace, their humil uh, humiliation. Jesus steps in. Look how she demonstrates, uh, demonstrates uh, her trust in him. Look what she says in verse 5. She says, and his mother said unto who? The servant, whatsoever he say unto you, do it. Can I tell you something? Whatever Jesus say that goes in the 20th century society, whatever he said, do it. <laughs> Don't argue, whether you understand it or not, do it. Hello, so Jesus is always right, and if there's any wrong, it's always on our end and not on God's end. Amen. Please understand that. Please understand that. Now, he says, my hour is not yet come. Now, we associate his timetable with what? His birth, death, as well as his sacrificial uh, surrendering of his body as the what? Lamb of God. Amen. He was on God's timetable and not on his mother's. Even though she had what? A critical situation, she knew who to go and what? Make her petitions known to. Make sure you know who to take your problems to. And sometimes we take our problems to who? The wrong people. Hello. Take your problem. Cast your burden on the Lord, for he careth for you. See, a lot of people don't care nothing about you. Hello. And sometimes we get caught up trying to take our burden to them rather than take them to the Lord. Amen. Because guess what? He can do miracles. He, does, he didn't promise you miracles, but he can do miracles. Amen. But now, he moves on here, moves on here now. Uh, we look at five, and his mother said unto the servants. Now, it was only a few servants there. He only had five disciples at this particular time. Plus who? The author, who was John, even though he doesn't mention himself. He's probably included. And the bride and the groom had what? A few servants. But there were very, very minimal people that really knew what was going on. Amen. That's why we call it sometimes a private miracle rather than a what? Public miracle. But it moves on. Look on here. His mother said to the servants, absolute trust in him. You need him. You need a relationship with him, so when you do have issues, you can take them to Jesus because you what? Have a relationship with him. Now, now, look at verse 6. And there were set what? Six. Note the word six. Six is incomplete. Seven is fullness and completion. What do these water pots represent? Six water pots of what? Stone. Can you change stone? No. What is that symbolic of? The law. The law was what? Written on stone tablet. Stone could not be changed. Did you hear me? Jesus was doing away with that. The stones represent hardcore. No changing, none whatsoever. Jesus was ushering in grace, God's divine favor. And in that grace was what? Something that you and I need, forgiveness 
all of your sins. Hello. Hello. So this represented the old Leviticus priesthood. 613 laws. Talk to me if you can. And if you broke one, you broke them all. I don't care if you kept them until the day before the day you died. If you broke one law, you were guilty of all. Amen. Jesus was ushering in grace. That was his announcement right here. That's the symbolism behind that. Now, six water pots here. Don't get caught up on the wine. <laughs> Please, I'm trying to tell you. Get the big picture here. What did all the wine and the changing represent? Amen. The change that Jesus was bringing about so you and I could have forgiveness of sin. At the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of his miracles, what? He shared that with us. Now, six water pots, each one of them containing two to three firkins. Now, firkins was what? Firkins were 10 gallons, so each pot could hold what? 20 to 30 gallons of uh, wine. And it said, look what the servants did. And, the, and, and they were made of stones, and they represented the Old Testament, the old priesthood, where they sacrificed what? Every day for forgiveness of sin after the manner of purifying of the Jews containing two to three firkins. So we're talking 20 to 30 gallons in each one of the containers. And so that bring you to about 120 to 130 gallons brand new wine. Okay. That was a gift to the bridegroom as well as the family. Relief from their what? Disastrous situation that they had got themselves up. And it's symbolic of Jesus what? Rescuing us from what? Our disaster. Being lost without a savior. Amen. Talk to me if you can. Now, it goes on here. Uh, he always provides for all of your needs. Amen. You can never accuse Jesus of not what? Providing you and rescuing you from all of your sins and your need. He shedded his blood on Calvary's cross and what? Cannot be changed. Can't change his mind. Why? He already did it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's love. Hello. Please remember that. He was proving to you that he was the Messiah. Love you. And I tell you, everybody, every smile and face that you see, don't love you. Hello. Amen. Please remember that. It moves on. Jesus loves us. Verse 7 here, it says, Jesus said unto them, what? Fill the water pot. And look how obedient they were. They did exactly what Jesus said. Amen. No question, just what? Nothing but obedience. That's what they did. They moved on here. And look what they did here. Look what they did. Look what they did. Fill the water pots with water. And they, very, very few people, just the servants now, just the servants, five, six disciples, maybe a few other servants, fill them to the what? That's important. The brim. That means that you couldn't get no more in there. None. Zero. You know why he did that? And you know why they recorded it? So they could not discredit Jesus for all the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, 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 he put the water in the pot, but then he turned around and added some wine to it. That really wasn't no miracle. Guess what? They can't say that. They fill the, fill the pots up so full of water, you couldn't get nothing else in it. Jesus did a miracle, and he did it for what? them and what he did miracles for you and me because he changed us 
for what? Sinners to saints. Amen. Talk to me. Amen. Now, now, it moves on here. He's delivered them. They're being obedience. They could not say it was not a miracle. Verse 8, and he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the what? Governor of the feast, and they bear it. We know what happened. We know what happened. We know. He told them, fill it up, draw it out. There was no time for fermentation, none whatsoever. How long does it take to make wine? At least probably about a year. If the plants and the vines are already there, God rains down the what? Rain, the rain goes in the ground, the roots suck up there. Then we get these clusters of grapes, mostly water in the grapes, and they go through the process of jumping around and, and, and the fermentation. Good wine. The older it was, the better it was. What did Jesus do? He accelerated the process. Did you hear that? And he has accelerated the process for you. God can take you further, faster, quicker in a few minutes or fractions of a minute than you can make it on your own in years. Hello. That's what God can do for you. That's why you need a relationship with him. Amen? Amen. He what? Accelerated the process. Now, we know this is a miracle. We know it sometimes it's not even accepted as a, as a public miracle, but this particular miracle has a particular name attached to it. He changed the water to wine, but what is the miracle called? It's called an accelerated miracle. Why? Because God accelerated the process. He did what would take a year, and he did it in a fraction of the time. That's why you did it. Go ahead on. They took it to the governor. This was the, which this was the master of ceremony. They called him the governor, uh, the feast, and they buried it. They took it to him, verse 9. And when the ruler of the feast tasted the water, look what he says now. He said, tasted the water that was made wine. Hello. Now, you're going to try to tell me that that was grape juice? It didn't say grape juice. It said wine. Hello, hello. It was the wine like they had every other time they made wine. This was no different. And some try to discredit Jesus and say, oh, no, 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 no alcohol content in that. Man, where did you come from? Did you see what this sir here said? Hello. I'd rather uh, accept what God said than to call him a liar. Come on now. Come on. And the governor, do you think this guy, this is the first time he's been the master of ceremony of a wedding? You think he has sense enough to know wine from water? Give yourself some credibility. When the ruler is the same one, he the governor, he, he's in charge of the food, the wine and the seating. This ain't the first time he did this. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. He didn't know where it come from. He didn't know who made it. But look what it says to put in there parenthetically. But the servants withdrew the water new and the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Look what he told him now. Look what he told him. And said unto him, every man at the beginning doth set for good wine. Hello? Uh, and when men have, look what it says, well drunken, well drunk. He's talking about intoxication right there. 
Some of them got intoxicated. Now you tell me they got drunk of water? Come on. No, no, no. Don't get hung up on the wine. Some people try to use this scripture to confirm that it's all right to drink wine. And I'm not going to say it's all right, and then I'm not going to say something wrong with it. But I will tell you one thing. Before you start to drink the wine, you need to ask yourself what's your motive for drinking the wine. Amen? Amen. Come on now. Most of us in the 20th century society drink it so we can get drunk. Hello? That wasn't why. They were celebrating. And what? It didn't, the Bible never advocates what? Drunkenness? Yes, they did socialize. But guess what? Drunken was not the issue here. Now, verse 10, look what he said. In the beginning, what? Good wine, and when men have what? Had a little bit too much, then when he brings out the what? The worst wine. But he that have kept, but thou hast kept the best or the good wine until now. Jesus' wine was far superior to any of the wine that he had taught, or just as good as any wine that he had experienced in his uh, job of being a governor and a ruler of a feast. This man was not talking about water, and he was not talking about grape juice. Regular wine of Jesus' day is what he was talking about. Hello, hello. Now, now, he had saved the what? Best for last. And what did God do? He brought in the Old Testament. He brought in the old officials, uh, um, the official uh, sacrificial system, and he saved the best for last. And who was the best? Jesus Christ. And he was the last one. And what? The Levitical priesthood changed because he sacrificed the blood of God himself when he was crucified. Amen. And he brought about cleansing and forgiveness of sin. That was Christianity that he ushered in. I mentioned it to you in the very, very beginning of the lesson. Amen. Please accept this symbolism and don't get caught up on the wine and miss the whole point of the whole thing. Amen. Amen. Now, last couple of verses, we out of here. Okay, verse 11. Verse 11 here, this beginning uh, of miracles here, did Jesus of Cana of Galilee, it reinforces right where they started in verse 1. Told you where it started out. They don't went right back to the very, very beginning. This was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And he started off doing miracles. So he could introduce himself to people as the what? Messianic king, as the Messiah that would come. He did miracles. He did miracles in order to confirm that he was the Messiah, the son of God. And when people seen what? How extraordinary, how full of splendor, majestic, and and, and magnificent and distinct and full of excellence and power and authority, they did what? They believed on him. The miracles was a sign. A sign was another word for a miracle. A sign always points to something. And it was pointing to Jesus as the Christ. Amen? Please understand that. That's what this lesson is about, to let you know that Jesus was really God. Amen? In the flesh, and he came down to earth and sacrificed himself to pay your sin debt and to pay mine. He announced it's going to be a change. What is another word that they use for change in the Bible? We, we use it too. What about metamorphosis? Amen? A little caterpillar 
and the cocoon. And guess what? He spins that cocoon. He goes in a worm, but when he comes out, beautiful butterfly. And that's what God turns all of us in. He turns us in from a worm. Hello. To a beautiful butterfly that can fly. And one day, we're going to make it all the way to heaven. All because of Jesus. Amen. A relationship with him. That's what he's trying to tell you. Here. Sign of miracles came out Galilee. The disciples did what? Believed on him. Last part of verse 11. And we got to do this. Right. Same thing. Why? Even though we wasn't there to see that miracle. Hello. The disciples told us what he did. Amen. We got a testimony. Though, even though we didn't see it with our eyes, we see it through their eyes. Jesus was a miracle worker. Amen. And you need a miracle worker in your life if you're going to make it from here to glory. You need Jesus. Last verse. After this, he went down to Capernaum. That was his headquarters. Going to be his headquarters. He was stationed in where? Nazareth. He moved to Capernaum, and that was what? The beginning of his spiritual ministry. And his ministry, what? Extended from Capernaum all the way into what? 20th century society today. And he sacrificed himself. How many times? One time. He announced it at the very beginning of his ministry, what he was going to do. Amen. Told the disciples, you're no longer going to be catching fish. You're going to be catching what? Catching men. And they've been catching men with the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like we just got done talking about for the last 2,000 years. Amen. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. I enjoyed teaching it. Don't get caught up on the wine. Hello. Look at what the wine represented. Amen. Majesty, splendor, power, authority, miracle working power, dunamis power, Jesus Christ. And you definitely need it. Amen. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. We thank you for the change, Lord. You made from water to wine. And we thank you, Lord. You've changed our lives. We got a testimony now. Not about what we did, but how you changed us from what we were to what we are now. In Jesus' name, amen.